Finally, the day has come. After spending months and months thinking about eating healthier, you finally decided to actually do it. And you're just going to the grocery store, excited to load up on some fruit and veggies and whole grains because you know that these are the best kinds of foods for you, but you hear a word that stops you in your tracks anti-nutrients. Plant foods have a ton of anti-nutrients and they are super bad for you. So now you're wondering, well, can we even eat anything anymore if even vegetables are bad for us now? Thankfully, I'm here to give you the science on anti-nutrients and see if we can bust this anti-nutrient myth. What are anti-nutrients? Anti-nutrients are plant compounds that prevent the absorption of certain nutrients and they're naturally found in a lot of plant foods in order for the plant to protect itself and prevent itself from being eaten or infected. When you eat them, they can block your body from absorbing other nutrients from your intestines. And so basically you're not getting the full potential of the nutrients that you could be getting from a food. So here are the most common anti-nutrients. Glucosinolates, which are found in cruciferous vegetables like broccoli or cabbage. Lectins, which are found in seeds, legumes, and grains. Oxalates, which are found in many vegetables and specifically leafy greens like spinach and kale. Phytates or phytic acid, which are found in seeds, grains, and legumes. And tannins, which are found in tea, coffee, wine, and also chocolate. So there are more than these, of course, but these are the most common ones. And now let's see if they are actually bad for you. Are anti-nutrients bad for you? So let's look at the potential downsides of the anti-nutrients that I just mentioned. Glucosinolates may prevent the absorption of iodine and may decrease thyroid hormone production. And this could be a problem for people who are suffering from hypothyroidism. However, this applies if you were to eat over one kilogram, so almost two pounds of raw kale or Brussels sprouts or certain collard greens a day. And if you were to do that over the course of several months, typical consumption of cabbage or broccoli would not contain enough glucosinolates to impair thyroid function. Lectins can bind to the lining of the small intestine, which can create lesions and also prevent the absorption of certain nutrients. So it's really important to soak and also boil lectin containing legumes so that this does not happen and you get rid of any potential lectin poisoning, or you can just use canned beans, which is what I do. Oxalates can bind to calcium, which can both limit its absorption and also create kidney stones. However, human studies show that overall, the intake of dietary oxalates is not a major risk factor Factor for kidney stones. Phytates reduce the absorption of many minerals such as calcium, iron, magnesium, uh, zinc. Tannins precipitate proteins. They also inhibit digestive enzymes and in general they affect the way our body uses vitamins and minerals and also they're particularly known to impact the absorption of iron. So basically here are the rare instances where anti-nutrients would be bad for you. If you are highly deficient in one of the nutrients that they block, if you have a specific predisposition like one for kidney stones, for instance, or if you eat enormous amounts of one specific anti-nutrient food all the time, all day, every day. How to reduce anti-nutrients. It's important to note that there are a few ways that you can reduce the anti-nutrient content of your food. First of all, you can soak beans and legumes overnight. You can also boil leafy greens and legumes, but you should note that phytates aren't commonly, um, you don't commonly get rid of them by boiling. You can also sprout seeds, grains, and legumes. This involves soaking them in cool water, then draining them, then placing them in a sprouter, and then repeating the process a few times during the day. I personally don't have time to do that and never do it, but it's totally something you can do and it's great for your health. It has lots of benefits. And most likely simply cooking the foods that you're going to eat can really help decrease the impact of the anti-nutrients. Do anti-nutrients have benefits? Well, despite their pretty negative name, anti-nutrients do have certain benefits. 
effects. Glucosinolates, for instance, have anti-cancer and chemoprotective effects, and they can help inhibit the growth of tumor cells. Lectins also have anti-cancer properties, and basically they are able to help destroy and then remove cancer cells. Phytates have many benefits, such as reducing the risk of kidney stone formation, also, they are able to reduce our blood glucose levels and lipid levels, and they are rich in antioxidants. And if you'd like to learn more about antioxidants, you can check out the video I made about that here. Or they, I mean, and they also have anti-cancer properties. And tannins have antioxidant and anti-cancer properties as well. And along with that, they have antimicrobial effects. So they're able to reduce the um, formation of like, bacteria, viruses, and things like that. So now you're probably really confused, like, okay, there are benefits, there are downsides, and who wins? Well, let's look at that in the next part. The anti-nutrient myth. It's very important to note that if you isolate every any single compound of a food, then it will not behave in the same way that it would inside the whole food. So basically, a food is more than the sum of its nutrients. This is what's known as the food matrix effect, and if you're interested in that, I made a video about it that you can check out here. Bearing this in mind, you can't reduce the effect of a food to one single one of its anti-nutrients, whether that be good or bad. That's why it's really important to look at the effects of the whole food on the body instead of isolating the anti-nutrients. And when we do this, we realize that the benefits, the health benefits of these foods outweigh the risks of the anti-nutrients by far. And there's in fact a pretty big myth surrounding anti-nutrients and their supposedly negative impact on human health. Studies show that a high intake of brassica vegetables, which contain glucosinolates, may be associated with a decreased chronic disease risk. Studies also show that although isolated and excessive lectin has potentially bad health outcomes, when consumed in the form of cooked or baked foods, it has no adverse effects whatsoever. And also beans are a very, very healthy food. They are rich in fiber, they are rich in protein, and they are associated with a lower risk of many diseases. So it would really, really be a shame to miss out on them just because you were afraid of the lectin content or fatted content that they had, for instance. Oxalates are perhaps the most controversial anti-nutrient because they aren't really associated with any benefits. However, studies show that the occasional consumption of high oxalate foods as long as it's you know within a healthy and balanced diet that does not pose any problem and oxalate containing foods are incredibly healthy and they do things such as reducing the incidence of cardiovascular disease decreasing the risk of colon cancer and slowing cognitive decline as for phytates a study showed that they had numerous health benefits and that an increased consumption of phytates was linked to a lower risk of diseases and vice versa. And the author went as far as arguing in favor of making phytate an essential nutrient. So, and finally, regarding tannins, studies show that an intake, a small intake of the right kind of tannins could actually be beneficial for human health because tannins have many potentially healthy beneficial effects that outweigh their negative effects. And also tea contains a lot of tannins and tea is associated with a lot of health benefits. So in short, these anti-nutrient containing foods are actually beneficial and healthy for you because we must consider the entire food and not just single out the anti-nutrient. If you want more information, more detail, everything more in depth, then at the end of my article, I link towards a study that really breaks down all of the benefits and downsides of these anti-nutrients. In short, anti-nutrients are plant compounds that can interfere with the absorption of certain nutrients. And they have certain downsides, such as maybe promoting the formation of kidney stones or, well, obviously impacting the absorption of nutrients or even affecting our gut. 
And it's also important to note that they do have some benefits such as antioxidant, anti-cancer, antimicrobial properties. But the key takeaway here is that a food cannot be reduced to a single one of its anti-nutrients. You have to take into account the entire food and when you do that, then the benefits of the foods far outweigh the risks. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like it and subscribe and see you on my next one. Bye.